Hi team, it's David. Hey, uh, I'm excited to present to you on uh, a subject that I think has great potential for improving your performance, particularly, of course, if you uh, ever come across an event where you're uh, performing in hot conditions, and that is heat acclimation. Of course, I think everyone's been in a situation where they've uh, been racing where it's been exceptionally warm, especially individuals who are training in the uh, Ironman, half Ironman marathon. Um, eventually, you're going to get into a very hot race. Um, a hot day is going to slow down just about uh, everybody, but there are some things you can do to mitigate the uh, effects of heat on your race and also to help have an understanding of how heat affects your performance and your body can help you make better decisions, I think, about how you're going to plan your race and how you can execute uh, physiologically as well as psychologically. So let's go ahead and get started on uh, this presentation. So I, I do want to help you understand the physio physiological impact of heat and how you can incorporate that into a plan to both acclimate and also to mitigate some of those effects when you're racing in the heat. I'm going to list the consequences of what happens if you're not acclimated. Um, I'm going to quantify that impact. I actually want to show you what are the real results of uh, what's happening to your body and can we quantify what's happening to your body when you're performing in the heat. I'll review the four uh, heat transfer processes that, uh, that we can take advantage of and which processes are more effective than others. Um, how to achieve that heat acclimation or at least have your body become a little bit more used to that heat so that you can perform a little bit better than you would normally in the heat. And then finally to show you how you can incorporate that into your annual training plan so that you can uh, get that acclimation time just right before an event that you anticipate might be a pretty warm event. And there are some events that are pretty uh, consistently year after year warm events that you could plan around. And of course, the payoff is improved performance. Now, let me clarify that not, not, not everyone needs to have heat acclimation as part of their race plan. This is um, really only if you are confident that the event you're going to be involved in is going to have some, some heat, or if you're an athlete who finds yourself struggling even if it's not very warm, let's say it's only uh, 75, 80 degrees, if you find yourself consistently struggling with that kind of heat, what you can do to, uh, to mitigate those, uh, those issues. All right, so why do, we, why do we care about incorporating heat acclimation? Why would you care? Um, the, uh, of course, as age groupers, as non-professionals, we tend to avoid training in the heat. It's not comfortable training in the heat. It, it's, uh, we recognize that it often it, it impairs performance. It uh, makes it so we can't perform as well. It makes it so that we uh, our workout doesn't feel as necessarily as intense or high quality because of the way that the uh, the heat has interfered with our ability to perform. So we tend to do our training in the morning when it's cool, in the evening when it's indoors, and we and we avoid those uh, really hot days. Unfortunately, it's actually difficult to avoid heat. Eventually, if you're doing an Ironman or even a 70.3, eventually you're going to be working out at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right? And it's going to be warm uh, at one of those days. So sooner or later, you're going to come across an event where you really do need to understand how to mitigate that heat. Um, the cruel irony as well is that the slower you are, the more likely you are to race in the heat because we tend to have, in a, let's say, an Ironman event, the pros are going to go first. Then you have the waves that take place. Sometimes, as an age grouper, you might not be starting until 8.30 in the morning. And if you're doing a, uh, if you're doing a uh, 11, 12-hour Ironman event, you're going to be running at 4 or 5 in the afternoon, and that's going to, that's going to be tough. <laughs> that's going to be hot. So actually, age groupers might need this even more than the professionals. Um, because they don't aren't exposed to it as much, and they're more likely to come across that heat when they're racing. Um, heavy athletes are particularly at risk. We'll talk about why. Um, and uh, of course, in summary, anyone who knows me knows that one of my uh, mantras is that we should mimic in our training what we expect to do in racing, and that our racing should simply be an extension of our training. So. If you think that you're going to be racing in some heat, you should be training in some heat. If you think you're going to be racing in hills, of course, you would train in hills. If you think you're going to be racing um, in an event that has uh, uh, high winds or an event that has uh, a lot of off-road, you would want to train in that environment. The weather, the, the temperature conditions are no different. If you can throw in that kind of uh, simulation to prepare yourself, you're going to do better when you perform on race day. Well, let's first talk about the consequences of not being heat acclimated. What's actually happening when 
uh, it gets warm? What are the things that are taking place? Well, the first thing that happens is that your, your, your skin and your muscles start competing for a finite amount of blood. Of course, you only have a certain amount of blood. And the, and the, the blood in our bodies is an amazing component of our systems. Um, of course, it carries oxygen to the muscles. But another thing that blood can do is that blood can help radiate heat away from the body. So as things start to get warm, what happens is the skin wants to draw the blood to the surface away from the muscles to help radiate that heat away to help facilitate cooling. And you may have noticed that some athletes, when they finish an event, if it's warm, they're really beat red in the face. Other athletes aren't beat red in the face. The athletes that are really red in the face, for whatever reason, their body was trying to draw as much blood as possible away from the muscles and to the, the surface, to the skin, to try and radiate that heat. Unfortunately, when you have more of the um, blood going to your skin, that means you're carrying less oxygen to your muscles, and so your performance is naturally going to decline at that point. So the, uh, the, one of the advantages of being heat acclimated is that you are reserving more of that precious blood, which is carrying necessary oxygen, to your muscles and not having it divert to your skin for the purposes of cooling. The second thing that's happening is it actually requires an, an enormously higher quantity of glycogen when you train in the heat. What's interesting about uh, your body is that even, you know, we're, we're, of course, we're warm-blooded mammals, and our body will do whatever it can do to regulate our temperature. But just like regulating the temperature in your house, if it's, a, if it's hot and you're trying to keep your house at uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it takes a lot of energy to dissipate heat. It take, if you look at your, you know, your air conditioning bill, if you, if you own a home, you can easily see that when you're cranking that AC, um, you're using a lot of energy. Our body's no different. It takes glycogen, the energy that our body uses to convert, or glycogen is converted into energy. It requires a ton of energy to cool your system. So the body's going to turn to glycogen as a primary fuel to cool that body, and it can increase your glycogen use by as much as 60%. So you know, if you spend all this time um, determining what your nutrition strategy is for a race, and a lot of athletes have really struggled taking in more than a few hundred calories an hour for an Ironman, but can you imagine if you have this finely tuned nutrition strategy um, that you're saying, I'm going to take in 300 calories an hour, I know that's going to be enough, I've done it in training, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where it is increasing your glycogen use by 60%, you'd have to compensate that by taking in 60% more calories. So training in the heat or racing in the heat without being acclimated can have a devastating impact on your nutrition strategy because it's pulling all the glycogen that you were counting on being able to hold on to for the duration of the race. It's pulling it to be able to, to cool your body. You can see from this chart an example of the, uh, the glycogen that is left in, in muscles after an hour of exercise. If we have a basically fully stocked at uh, 100 millimoles per, per kilogram of glycogen after an hour of exercise in cool environment, yeah, we, we've lost 40% of that. But after 60 minutes of exercise, we've lost a ton of glycogen um, due to our body trying to uh, compensate by using the glycogen as fuel to cool the body. So that's number two reason we, uh, we struggle in the heat. Also amazing, um, this quick chart here, is that um, most of the energy that we use or, or the, the process that converts glycogen into energy, unfortunately, most of that fuel is just dissipated as waste heat. We are unfortunately very inefficient as mammals in processing glycogen. Most of the energy that is used is just wasted, and only 25% of it goes toward actually moving us forward. The rest of it is just the uh, byproduct, if you will, of, of converting uh, glycogen to energy. So um, you'll notice down here that a 150-pound runner at the bottom of this chart um, is going to be burning about 882 uh, calories an hour. A 200-pound runner is going to be burning almost 1,200 calories per hour. But unfortunately, uh, most of that is going to just wasted heat, which has to be either absorbed by your body or dissipated as quickly as possible. Um, so the, the bigger runner you are, the more waste heat you have to deal with getting rid of. And that's why there's large, one of the reasons why large runners have such a hard time compared to smaller runners in the heat. All right, number three, higher concentrate of lactate. Um, so not only are we losing glycogen, 
we are increasing our lactate concentrations. And I know that we could, we could have a separate conversation, is that really bad or is that not really bad? But let's take a classical view of lactate, and let's take a classical view that, that for, for many coaches, a, a level of four uh, millimoles per liter of lactate is kind of considered your lactate threshold. If you were to take a test and draw blood um, at what you, what you felt was like a, a threshold that you could hold for maybe 30 to 60 minutes. So it's, you know, that's considered a threshold, your FTP pace. It's going to be about 4 millimoles per, per liter of, uh, of lactate that's, been, that's building up. So you can see the huge difference here, right? That after, if you're, in the, if you're exercising in a cool environment, um, let's say you're going in about zone 3, you're never going to hit that uh, zone 4 lactate threshold. You're going to stay nice and easy and lactate's going to kind of go bounce around. But for that same intensity, if it's hot, you will easily go into your zone five, essentially, way above your, your zone three, zone four. Um, and, uh, and so for a, for a given pace. So all the training that you did where you said to yourself, you know, I, I know I can hold um, this uh, eight, eight and a half minute mile for my half marathon in my, uh, in my half Ironman. I've done it in training. It's all great. All of a sudden, that eight and a half minute mile, what used to be something you could hold, is now building up massive concentrations of lactate um, because of the heat. All right, number four. Boy, this, this is awful. There's all these terrible, this, you're never going to want to train or race in the heat again. All right, number four, an increased heart rate for a given power output. Um, because we have a decrease in blood available to the muscles, the heart recognizes this, and it's trying to get more oxygen to the muscles. What it has to do is an increased stroke rate. So that's how the body compensates when the blood is being diverted to your skin to help radiate the heat away. Your heart says, whoa, I've got to find a way, to, a method to divert more oxygen to the muscles, so I need to increase my stroke rate, which of course means you're going to have to increase your heart rate. Um, and this is a, uh, an example of, a, of an individual athlete uh, on a treadmill at 14 kilometers per hour. In a relatively cool environment, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, at that 14 kilometers per hour, he's holding steady at 165. For that same output, that same speed, if it's hot, now granted this is exceptionally hot, um, for basically 25 degrees difference in Fahrenheit in temperature, the heart rate increases by 25 degrees as well. So all this, this pacing you've done and your zones that you've tested, your heart rate zones that you've put together, saying, I know that I can maintain a, uh, a, a 155 for my half Ironman, and that's what I've done in training, and, and it should work out well. All of a sudden, if it's a hot day, that 155 is going to be much slower for that particular heart rate because your uh, heart has to work so much harder to try and get oxygen to the muscles. It just artificially inflates that heart rate. So you may be underperforming and not knowing it because you feel like, hey, I, I really shouldn't go more than 155, when in fact that's almost an artificial heart rate because your heart's just trying to get more oxygen to the muscles. Anyway, so it, regardless, it's bad, right? We all agree it's, that these are some terrible components related to uh, training or racing in the heat. So what are the characteristics of someone who's heat acclimated, someone who's actually... Um, uh, able to uh, to do this to do this very well, and they're uh, they've been acclimated to the heat. Well, those characteristics um, would include uh, obviously more blood flowing to the muscles. They don't need to have the blood divert to the skin. They're going to have a decrease in glycogen use, so they can save that precious glycogen for uh, the those long events. They have decrease in lactate concentrations. They have a decreased heart rate output for a or a decreased heart rate for a given output, um, and uh, they are going to be able to perform much better than another athlete who had no heat acclimation training. Now, one thing that's important to, uh, to specify is that no matter how well you acclimate to the heat, you will always perform worse in the heat than you do in a cool environment, almost universally. Um, the question is not can you get rid of the issues from training in the heat. The question is can you mitigate those issues from training in the heat? And the answer is yes, you can mitigate that by doing some specific steps. Um, who is that? Devilishly good-looking runner. What good form? That's a uh, that's a just a handsome guy. All right. Uh, how is heat eliminated from the body? So let's talk about. All right. Now we know that uh, heat is bad to the body. Uh, we want to get rid of it. How the heck do we get rid of it? How do we get rid of this excess heat? There's four ways that uh, heat is transferred or energy is transferred um, uh, between uh, mass, different types of mass, essentially. One is conduction. Um, conduction is the transfer of heat uh, from direct contact. It's, it's directly from molecule to molecule. It's energy transferring as, as we touch. If I take uh, my, uh, my cold hand 
and put it on your warm hand, you're going to feel the energy want to flow between that warm and cold area. If you take your hand and put it on a cold surface, you're going to feel the heat drawn out of your hand. So conduction is just simply the, the transfer of uh, energy from one uh, contact point to another. Then we have convection, a little bit different. This is the transfer of heat through a liquid or gas. So uh, when we blow in our soup, that's a form of convection. It's also a little bit of conduction because there's some uh, mass that's there, but really it's really convection. Um, if we, when we uh, pour cool water over something, um, that is a form of convection. It's drawing the heat away um, through a, a stream of air or a stream of water, essentially. We have radiation, which is uh, the way that we, uh, if you were to look at something in uh, uh, infrared spectrum. That infrared spectrum is what sees uh, radiation. So, and when you see those cool night goggles on uh, military guys and they're looking at people that are glowing green or red in the dark, that's radiation that's being detected. And finally, we have evaporation. This is the process uh, you might have uh, be familiar with evaporative coolers that you can cool houses um, where you um, have a uh, bunch of water drawing heat away from evaporation or the, the process of the uh, water turning from uh, liquid water to water vapor um, as it uh, evaporates. It's an, you also might notice that as you step out of the shower and you feel cold, even though it's, it might be 75 degrees in your bathroom, even though you step out of your shower and it's warm in your shower, you feel cold because you're evaporating uh, water from your skin and that that makes your body recognize it's losing heat and so it, it sends a cold signal to your brain because you're losing heat rapidly even though it's warm there because it's evaporating off you so quickly so those are the four major uh, four, really the only four only ways that heat is transferred between systems um, so at rest our body uses a combination of evaporation radiation and uh, conduction or convection so when we're sitting down if, as I sit and, and provide you with this uh, presentation, uh, most of the heat that's dissipating from my body is coming from radiation. It's just radiating out. Um, there's a little bit from my my uh, my butt coming out. Uh, <laughs> that's probably not the right way to put it. My butt in contact with my chair is having heat loss via conduction, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and then a little bit of evaporation. There is a little bit of moisture on my skin, um, and that's evaporating off uh, and also evaporating through your, your eyes, through your mouth, et cetera. Um, and so at rest, we, uh, we have one set of systems that's used. However, when we exercise, our body depends highly on evaporation. Look at the amount of heat dissipation we need to do to get rid uh, our body turns to primarily evaporation and very little radiation. Radiation is a very ineffective way to get rid of all that heat when we're exercising. A little bit of conduction, convection, a lot of convection if we're, if we're moving on the bike, if we're moving on the run, we get that wind effect and that convection will cool us a little bit. But the, what the, the point of this slide is that we need to be good evaporators. We need to be good sweaters. If we want to be able to dissipate heat effectively, we have got to be able to evaporate that heat and that means sweat for a mammal like us. So increasing efficiency of sweating is the key to heat transfer for you and I. So what happens when we, uh, physiologically, when we heat acclimate that athlete with sweat? Well, first of all, the sweat, the, the rate of sweat increases, which is good. So people who are highly acclimated actually will sweat more than those who don't sweat a lot. Um, the sweat rate increases in more exposed areas, like the forearms, for example. You're going to start to see sweat really collect on the forearms, which is highly exposed. Um, it increases more in areas that are effective at dissipating heat, like the top of the head. Um, and the sweating starts earlier in exercise, which is another advantage of being a good heat acclimated athlete, is your sweating starts earlier, so you're not having to play catch up in dissipating heat later on in your, in your athletic activity. So that's what's happening to the heat acclimated athletes. They're basically becoming more effective sweaters through those four points. Um, I do want to take a moment and talk about um, this slide about cramping. Now, the reason this, this slide is is it's a little misplaced in this presentation, but I would uh, like to include it here for a couple reasons. One is that for years, when I presented heat acclimation, I included another benefit of um, heat acclimation. One, of course, is the sweating, but another is that in heat acclimated athletes, the concentration of electrolytes in sweat is reduced. What that means is that, again, athletes who are highly acclimated to heat, when they sweat, they're losing less electrolytes through their sweat. The sweat is more diluted, it's closer to water, and the electrolytes stay in their system. Now, for many, many years, in fact, decades, we 
of course, thought that maintaining electrolytes was the key to avoiding cramps and that we did not want to lose electrolytes because then we'd increase our risk for cramps. Um, a good visual example of this is you, you may have seen as athletes come across the line after a marathon, half marathon, Ironman, etc. Many of them are caked in salt. I mean, on their, on their jersey, for example, you can just see this layer of salt. Some people come across and they're all wet from sweating, right? But some of them don't have this layer of, of, of salt that's included in their sweat. And the reason is the athletes that have a high level of salt all over them are ineffective sweaters and they're losing a ton of electrolytes as they sweat. The athletes who come across the finish line who don't have all that caking of salt are effective sweaters. They're not losing a lot of electrolytes as they sweat. So for years when I presented this, um, I, I made this an important benefit. But now, um, I feel it's important to kind of rectify that error that I have uh, propagated for so many years, is that there's so many myths behind cramping. And, and honestly, I, I, I'm only been an, on this bandwagon for five years, so I, I'm pretty much a Johnny-come-lately compared to many physiologists who were 10, 15 years ago saying, cramping has nothing to do with electrolytes. And I want to tell you why. Um, sodium uh, and electrolyte concentrations actually increase with fluid loss. You're not actually losing sodium concentrations. It's, it's, imagine this, take a pot of boiling water, add salt to it, and boil the pot. Um, come back half hour later, how much salt is left in the pot? All the salt is left in the pot. You're not losing the salt when you sweat. The water is going away, but you're losing very little electrolytes. Even the athlete who's losing a lot of salt because he's not heat acclimated, uh, he's losing much more water than he's losing electrolytes. So his con even though he, his net electrolytes may be less, the concentration of electrolytes is actually higher because they are losing a lot more fluid uh, than they are electrolytes, even for someone who's losing a lot of electrolytes. And so your concentrations actually increases as you become dehydrated. If muscle cramps were elected, uh, were really linked to uh, electrolyte loss, we would cramp in all muscles, not just the primary movers of our muscles, right? If, if really we were cramping from loss of electrolytes, we would cramp in our hands, we would cramp in our biceps, we would cramp um, in our buttocks, we would cramp not just in the hamstrings and quads where the cramping seems to be, almost, or maybe the feet, almost exclusively located. Basically, if it was a universal loss in electrolytes across the body that was causing us to cramp, we would have universal cramping episodes in all muscles of the body, not just the primary movers. And finally, one great study on this is that they, uh, they took some crampers and uh, and they, they could duplicate or replicate the cramping pretty much on demand from these, these people that cramped. And in three of those five athletes who were cramping, within 30 seconds of taking pickle juice, the cramp went away. Um, now what that means is that it's not possible for the pickle juice electrolytes to get into your stomach, process through the digestion, get into your bloodstream, and get into your muscles in 30 seconds. There is clearly some sort of neurological process that is, that is key to cramping and not a, a lack of a particular electrolyte. Okay, I'm starting to soapbox now. We're going we're gonna to move on uh, as quickly as possible here. Let me show you a few more examples of why your cramps have nothing to do with electrolytes. Um, a couple of case studies. One is a, uh, a marathon. Um, this is a longer marathon. You'll notice it's 56 kilometers as opposed to a uh, typical 42-kilometer event, so it's a much longer uh, race than normal. Um, they looked at uh, 21 uh, crampers and 22 non-crampers that came across the line. As you can see, their levels of electrolytes are identical. I mean, there's a, there's a little difference there, but if you look at the margin of error, that plus or minus 2.1, that means that statistically, all of those numbers are identical. Um, they, there is no difference in electrolyte levels between those that cramped and those that did not cramp. In fact, the people that lost more fluid were the ones that did not cramp. The ones that lost 4% of their body weight from fluid did not cramp. The ones that only lost 3% of their body weight did cramp. Um, so it appears that actually that higher concentration of electrolytes makes you less likely um, to, to cramp um, than uh, by losing a lot of, of sweat than the, than the crampers did. There's one example. 
Uh, another example is actually in Iron Man. This is also from 2005. We see the same thing. The, uh, the amount of, of electrolytes that takes place post-race from the controls who did not cramp and the crampers who did cramp is the same. Um, there's no difference in electrolyte levels um, in crampers versus non-crampers. What you might notice here, though, is check out the race time. There is a interesting, if not necessarily statistically significant difference in the race time between the crampers and the uh, and the non-crampers. The crampers appear to be a little bit faster than the non-crampers, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Anyway, but this is a uh, two two examples of studies that would further indicate that cramps are not related to electrolytes. So if they're not about electrolytes, what are they about? I mean, especially those of you who are frustrated with, with dealing with cramps, um, you're probably saying to yourself, okay, David, fine. Uh, if not electrolytes, what is it? And, and the answer is, I'm afraid, is that it is still a medical mystery. And it does appear to be some sort of brain regulator um, that is sending incorrect signals to the muscles and that for many athletes, acetic acid and physical juice appears to reboot that communication. Um, it doesn't work for everybody, but if you're struggling with cramps, I would try the pickle juice. I, I have one athlete who doesn't even swallow the pickle juice. She just rinses the pickle juice in her mouth and spits it out, and that's enough to reboot her cramps, and her cramps will go away for 20, 30 minutes before they come back. So what we think you can do to mitigate those cramps is uh, is to consider heat as a fatigue source and actually train for the heat so that uh, heat is not something that's new to you on race day. Um, more specific training. Pacing is going to be critical. I don't think I've stressed pacing enough on this, but I am confident that the number one cause of cramps, if you experience cramps in racing that you did not experience in training, you are racing too fast. Your pacing is not consistent with your training. If you're experiencing cramps in training, that's something different. That, that would, that's a much more difficult thing to troubleshoot. But if you're not experiencing cramps in training and you are experiencing cramps in racing, you are racing too hard. You're going beyond the capabilities that you exposed yourself to and the intensities that you exposed yourself to while training. Now, obviously, the goal of, of a race is to do better than in training, but you really aren't going to be doing more than two, three, four, five percent better in racing than you are in training. And if you go beyond that, you're introducing new risks, which would include cramping. Um, you can also, this is kind of a post thing, you can reduce heat by cooling the muscles afterwards. It's, it's, it's difficult to cool those muscles during. You can throw ice in your chest, you can throw ice in your hat, you can wear those ice gloves. But as you recall from a previous slide, the process of, con of uh, convection and conduction and radiation when you exercise does not dissipate much heat. So throwing ice in a cap is going to help a little bit. But that is the process of uh, conduction, and that is really not very effective. It will help. It's better than nothing, but not as much as being an effective sweater. All right. I, 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 I'm not sure if I should even include this, this chart. Every time I look at this chart, I feel like I need to like, go take a nap after I, I look at it. I'm, I'm trying to show the, the relationship between um, being an effective sweater uh, and being heat acclimated to improve performance. And I, and I hope this chart speaks for itself. I'm not even going to try and explain this chart, but you can see that we have the benefits there in the lower left. Uh, all those in lead to a cooler skin temperature, which increases to less glycogen use, more blood to the muscles, which leads to a better performance, less lactate buildup. You have reduced cramping, um, which is, uh, is related to proper pacing, which improves your muscle performance, which also improves performance. Um, I may have to get rid of this slide. Every time I look at it, I, I second guess why it's here. But I hope you get the idea is that there's a chain of events that takes place if you become an effective sweater. All right. Now, now that I hope I've convinced you, yes, David, I get it. You spent 30 minutes telling me why heat acclimation is important, what happens to the body, why it's bad. So how do I get better at it? How do I become a more effective sweater? How do I become heat acclimated? It's not that difficult actually to do. It does take some dedication and some planning, but anybody can do that. The key is to exercise for an hour a day in the heat for five to 10 days. You don't have to go out and do your bricks at from noon to six o'clock at the hottest part of the day. But what you should try and do is plan at least an hour of that brick at the hottest part of the day. So instead of avoiding the heat and starting your brick at 5 in the morning, so you know you'll be done uh, for your Ironman brick by noon, I would say start at 7 in the morning and let yourself have an hour, that last hour, of some pretty warm training. 
The next day, you might wear a wetsuit in the pool, right? It's going to be warm for your, uh, for your 4,000 meter time trial swim that you're going to do. Put on the wetsuit. That's another hour of heat acclimation training. Next day, you're going to do your, your hour easy run. I would consider doing that in the heat. The next day, you're going to be on your trainer downstairs. Put on, some, put on a hat. Put on some gloves. Put on a warm coat. It's a two hour ride indoors. Just an hour is all we need. You don't have to go more than an hour a day, but for an hour a day, five to 10 days, you want to introduce heat into your training. The heat should not be, you should not be, you should not be miserable, you should be very uncomfortable. So the, the level of heat you want to expose yourself to is a level that is uncomfortable. It is not miserable. We don't want you to be in agony. This should be uncomfortable heat. Otherwise, it could be dangerous, right? I don't want you to go out and get heat stroke from, because Warden told you to go practice in the heat. We're going to reduce the intensity during the, uh, we're reducing the intensity during the first few days of that heat acclimating training. Obviously, it's, it will affect some of your performance um, because you're going, to be, you're going to have all the problems I laid out by training in the heat are going to take place if you deliberately introduce heat into your training. But once you're acclimated, you're going to be able to, it's going to become easier and easier for you to do. And the acclimation lasts for up to 10 days. So when do we incorporate this? This is my recommendation of when we incorporate it. This is a, uh, let's say this is a, uh, a volume chart of a, uh, uh, of a high performing Ironman athlete. He's going to do one last peak of 18, 21, and 23 hours of volume. Then he's going to do a rest week of 11 and a half hours, and then a three week taper going from 17, 13 to 11 hours on uh, the week of his Ironman. So this is a, this is an aggressive, granted, uh, an aggressive, training plan, your, your chart may look similar, although it may be 12, 14, 16 instead of 18, 21, 23 for your Ironman, for example. Um, we would want to introduce the uh, heat acclimation 17 days before your race starts. And I've chosen 17 days because that gives you 10 days to do an hour a day heat, a heat acclimation and then seven days of not exposing yourself to heat so you can truly recover for that last week with not having heat added as a, as a fatigue source. Um, and that still gives you, because the heat acclimation lasts for 10 days, you should still have the benefits of that heat acclimation on race day. So again, you're going to start 17 days out. You're going to do it for an hour a day for 10 days. You're going to start, you're going to stop seven days before your event. That way you're not introducing more fatigue uh, through heat training. And for that last week, you'll be able to really recover well. So that's my recommendation on how you introduce that heat acclimation so you can be better. And then just in general, it doesn't mean you have to necessarily only heat acclimate during this 10-day period. Throughout the whole summer, throughout the whole spring, maybe once or twice a week, deliberately try and have one of your runs be done in a warm environment. Because the best way to become an efficient sweater is not just 10 days a year and practicing it just 10 days a year. The best thing to do is to practice a lot. And uh, I, I wouldn't do it every day just because that does affect your performance and then you can't improve fitness because your performance is being limited due to the heat. But once or twice a week, nothing wrong with going out and doing a run at the hot part of the day, especially like an easy hour run. Let your body learn to sweat. Let it learn to make those changes so you become a more effective sweater and you become better at being heat acclimated. All right, so in summary, the performance impact of exercise in the heat cannot be eliminated, but you can reduce the effects. Evaporation is the most effective way to transfer heat, and it's really the only method that you can prove physiologically, which is an interesting concept when you think about it because you can't train your body to be better at conduction. You can't train your body to be better at convection in terms of heat dissipation. The only thing you can train your body to be better at is evaporation, which fortunately is the most effective way to get rid of heat. Um, Exercise in the heat for an hour a day for 10 days can produce increased tolerance to heat for up to 10 additional days. And then I'd recommend you start the heat acclimation about 17 days before a race. Um, anyway, thank you for your time. Uh, it's a subject that I really enjoy. I've uh, practiced this myself. I've implemented it with many athletes. It uh, has made a huge difference. As you know, heat can be a massive uh, deal breaker in races. Uh, at the time of this particular presentation, um, you might, in, at least last year at Coeur d'Alene, it was unbelievable heat. Frankfurt as well. In uh, last year, the Frankfurt Ironman had incredibly high temperatures, record temperatures. I, I, Frankfurt and Coeur d'Alene last year were two of the hottest events I've ever seen at an Ironman. Uh, eventually it'll happen to you, but these are some steps that you can take that will help reduce the impact to your performance. Thanks guys. Thanks for being a member of Team Iron Cowboy and I'll see you out in the forums.